Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. While I'm waiting for my presentation uh, to be loaded, I would just take a minute to introduce myself. My name is Maria Mathai, and uh, I've, I'm based here in Delhi, and I work for the University of Alberta in Canada. Our university is a state university. It's about 100 years old. It was uh, set up in 1908, and uh, we have about 40,000 students. Uh, four or five campuses, and it's uh, based in a city called Edmonton, which is on Western Canada. I guess uh, for this audience, what is more important to know is that uh, we have one of the oldest faculty of education in the country, which is uh, one of the oldest Canadian education departments. In fact, our faculty of education is supposed to be older than the university because the faculty of education got incorporated into the university much later. In Canada, unlike here in India, education is a state responsibility. It's not a central responsibility. So there are very uh, clear differences. That is one thing I thought I will mention. The second thing that is important to mention while I'm going to speak is that uh, Canadian education, especially higher education, is mostly public, which means it's all government institutions. There is, uh, like till 10 years ago, which is when I started working for Canadian education, there were actually no private universities in Canada. But in the last five years, there are one or two private universities which have come up. But uh, lar like, largely, you will find that Canadian education is still, uh, higher education is completely government driven, and it's each state's responsibility to ensure that the universities in those states deliver quality. Now, for my session today, I was told to talk, like to talk on two, focus on maybe two major points, which is one is how can brain drain be plugged by providing world-class education here in India? And the second was to how to make India a hub for quality higher education. In fact, uh, like, you know, how do you stop students from go going from India out of this country and encourage, like, you know, from my perspective, I thought both of these topics, you can have a whole conferences around them. They, these are very big topics, these are very broad topics. So I'm not going to be talking about government regulation, what are the things that we as a country need to change, because these are societal issues, these are not just uh, uh, inst institutional or organizational issues. And I'm not really going to, again, I think like Anurag said, I'm not going to focus on a lot of terminologies. I'm going to keep it simple. I started my career as a teacher here in India. I've taught for 10 years. I shifted from teaching. I worked for a company called Intel in its education division. And then I joined Canadian Education and I've been working for the University of Alberta for the last four years. So in my experience of both with the Indian Education and the Canadian Education, I'm going to speak, like I'm going to highlight a few key differences which I feel will help make our, which is Indian institutions, world-class institutions. So the first thing, like I said, when you're talking about India as a global education hub, the reality is, as of today, India is a global education hub. I don't know how many of you have, like, I am sharing the da dais with somebody, like, you know, Professor Harshe, who is from South Asian University, which in itself tells us that there are enough students here from South Asia. When I was doing my research, I found out there are students from 153 countries studying in Indian higher educational institutions. Now, I'll talk a bit about the numbers later, but the reality is India is already a global education hub. Yes, there are not too many students from Western countries who are opting to study in India, but overall I think we do have a very reasonably good reputation as a study destination. But when you're looking at developing us or India as a global education hub beyond what is there today, then there are many factors which you have to take into consideration. So you have to look at the local environment, whether it is the government regulations, whether it is visa restrictions on students. You have to have more flexible options, and I think that is one of the biggest failings of the higher education system here in India, where there is practically zero flexibility 
and there is really no inter stream movement at all like and i'm not just talking about subjects i'm talking about movement within universities how easy is it to go from a delhi university to a university of pune in the middle of your in the middle of your courses i'm not talking after finishing your bachelor's you move for your masters to another university i am asking if you're doing your bachelor's if i want to do one term uh in university of pune on one particular subject is that possible is that feasible the third which i think some of the previous speakers also have referred to is the lack of research facilities that is a very big reason why people don't still take india seriously as an education hub the fourth is employment people who move for education also look for employment and uh, that is i think something which is just again in the last two decades india has developed as a employer not just for within india but as a global employer so that's also changed and the last which is most important is the living conditions when an international student comes to study here he or she is also living in this society so the societal factors are also very important to take into consideration i'll move from here to uh, brain drain it's uh, it's actually something which i find like in india the brain drain is still a very relevant topic but globally the concerns of brain drain have moved from a brain drain situation to a brain gain situation to now what we like at least in canadian institutions what is the terminology is brain circulation because the reality is that people are no longer staying in any one country now this i don't know if you can see this uh, infographic it's a very like it's basically an analysis of different countries if you can see on the right the orange arrows are number of people number of people who are immigrating out of a country and the green which is on the left i think it should be yeah, your left is the number of people who are moving out of the country versus number of scientists and professionals who are moving into the country so the first green arrow as you can see all the countries in the middle there are two dots where you don't see green these are the countries india italy and japan where people are not coming to these countries to do research or to do higher studies but the other arrow you will see india is the largest the maximum number of indian professionals are moving abroad but there are not enough professionals from the rest of the world coming in to replace that so yes for india brain drain is still relevant however for the rest of the world it is something which is no longer becoming a big concern because they're finding that people are moving across different countries uh people go where research is there people will go where employment is there and that is changing over and over like again so since this is an audience of education providers people who own educational institutions there are a few things which i thought uh from my experience i find that indian institutions are still lagging behind with the rest of the world and if we as education providers can include this in our like in our institutions be it schools be it colleges or be it within the system these are the things which will then pretty much bring us on par with any other country across the world because reality is we do have a very good education system we do not have a consistently good education system that is i think the difference the biggest difference i would say between india and canada would not be that there are not institutions at par we have excellent institutions here at the school level as well as at the college level the dif biggest difference is in canada you can go to any university big and small and you're assured of a quality education whereas here in india you don't you really can't do that you can't just walk into any institution school or college and assume that you will get the best education that is possible so four five things five points i've noted down these are again global points because we really don't have the time to go into a great detail and i will elaborate on these points the first is of course international experience now the numbers 
all of us are very familiar with the number of students who are going out of India to study. So this is like, you know, this is the statistics that you will see. Now from 2005 to 2011, the total number of Indian students who have gone abroad have moved from one and a half lakhs to 2.3 lakhs. Last year, which, sorry, two years ago, 2012, it is, I think, for the first time that there has been a drop. It's not a very high drop. It's a very, statistically speaking, I would say it's just maybe a 1% or a 2% drop. But for the first time, we are seeing a drop in the total number of students who are going to study abroad from India. So yes, study abroad is still an option, but I think it's important to recognize that because environment here in India is quite exciting, a lot of people are choosing to stay on. Second, like a lot of people who have gone out are coming back. And th this is one category of students. The other category of students you have are foreign students who are coming to study within India. I talked about this a bit earlier. You'll see that there are about, this is an MHRD uh, like report which says that approximately 31 students from 150, 31,000 students from 153 countries are studying here in India. Now, what are the opportunities for these students? Do they get employments? Can they do masters over here? Can they apply for uh, jobs within the public sector? As such, most students who choose to study abroad, the assumption is that if you're studying abroad, you're going to stay abroad, you're going to immigrate. Or if you come back, you're coming back because you have a family business. There really are not too many opportunities to encourage students to come back to India. I know that it's changing a bit, but still, there is still a lot more which can be done. And as of date, I think most of the opportunities that exist, exist in private, not so much in government or public sphere. The second big difference between our institutions and institutions in Canada would be about gender issues. Uh, we are still, in terms of gender equality, in terms of number of girls studying, like in terms of enrollment ratio, in terms of women being in employment, I, even though education is, I think, one of the few industries where I find that women dominate. But globally speaking, we are not, uh, like in any other industry, we really don't have the kind of the gender equivalency that exists in other countries. So that's one other factor that we should take into consideration. The third factor, which again, I think both the previous, uh, like, Anurag mentioned this. He talked about how do we engage with the WhatsApp generation. Our, like, you know, we are, I think, what we are, whether we are Generation X or Generation Y, the reality is that the children that we are teaching, be it at school or in college, they're already Generation Z. They have grown up in an environment that we are still coming to terms with. So, if I just did a simple experiment today in the morning, if I look, if I go through Google, because now Google is pretty much God. If Google tells you something, you kind of believe it. If I just do a simple exercise on Google, how to teach Generation X, I get about four crore results. When I type how to teach Generation Y, I get 1.8 crore results. Generation Z, 1.48 crore results. Surprisingly, for the generation which has been brought up with the internet, which is completely in tune with the internet, which has always had like, you know, when the moment they enter the school, they've had computer access. For that generation, teaching methodology or suggestions or training or research papers or just presence on the internet of that much of knowledge is much lesser than teaching methodology for a generation which is 20 years old. So these are things that you, when you're talking to your, when your institutions are being built, these are things that you have to figure out. How do you reach out? What is the role of your teacher? What is the role of a school in a, like for a generation which has a smartphone and is just going to Google a fact and tell you the answer before the teacher is finished? the question. How do you engage with that kind of a generation? That is kind of going to be key
to building your institution's profile. And my last point is technology. Technology is a huge, huge differentiator across the board, across different societies, and especially in our society where we have problems of access also. The reality is, and this is like, I use this quote a lot because I really, I think it's a pretty strong quote. The reality is that 47% of all jobs will be automated by like in another 20 years. 20 years is not too far away. It is not another 50 years down the line where you're thinking of another different world. 20 years is going to be in all our working life cycle for most of us. But our education and our systems, are we actually preparing students for this kind of a society or this kind of an environment? And are we ourselves prepared to develop our institutions into these kind of environments? Again, this is something which I thought was very relevant. Like, we are not really prepared. We have a computer in the classroom. We trying to, like, you know, we've automated software, but we are still not using technology as a tool the way we used a blackboard or a chalk. We are still more comfortable with a blackboard and a chalk. And technology is something which is to be framed and is to be used. So the faster we as educational institutions incorporate technology as a teaching tool. And I really don't believe in all this that, you know, that technology technology is going to replace teachers or it's going to replace institutions. I think uh, the in like you know the face-to-face -face interaction what a teacher provides or what an educational institution provides to a school is something which is not measurable. So things like technology will always go under aid but that's my personal opinion. But the reality is like yes Technology will not replace teachers. Everybody knows that. But if you don't move with the times, if you don't read the signs of the time, then your teachers who do not use technology will slowly become obsolete, however nice people they are. So on that note, I'm going to kind of uh, end. That's, uh, that's me. I, uh, if there are any questions, maybe if, so would you like to kind of go first and then we could have questions? I don't know what the format is going to be. Yeah. Okay, fine. So thank you very much for listening and uh, I'll take questions at the end. Thank you.